Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Khalid Jashan. I'm Executive Director of Arab Center. I'd like to welcome all of you uh, to this uh, briefing. Um, as you know, uh, there is an event taking place uh, at this time as we speak at the White House. The President just uh, picked up the microphone a couple minutes ago before we sat down here and said that the Palestinians are trapped in a cycle of violence and began to talk about uh, what his uh, uh, plans are, but at any rate, we feel that this is an important development, uh, like it or not, whether you agree with the basic premises of the plan or not, so that's the purpose of this uh, briefing today. Uh, helping us uh, with uh, trying to understand uh, the implications uh, for U.S. foreign policy, for Palestinian uh, case, for the is Israeli side, uh, for regional implications. Uh, are two uh, scholars and uh, two great friends uh, who have had uh, many years of experience uh, in this issue, particularly also on uh, attempts at peacemaking uh, in the Middle East, which has been a national sport for us in this country for quite a few years, as, uh, as you know. Uh, I don't want to introduce him in detail because you have their bios in this uh, flyer that, uh, that was given to you when you came in, but let me just say uh, first to my left is uh, Phyllis Bennis, uh, who is the director of the New Internationalism uh, Project at the Institute for Policy Studies. Uh, she's a uh, well-known, internationally known activist on Palestinian issues uh, for many years, has been very active in uh, Palestinian rights campaigns here in this country uh, and uh, worldwide. Uh, she has been involved with different UN agencies over the years and actually was a, a finalist, shortlisted uh, on a couple of occasions when the UN was uh, considering uh, replacing, uh, at the time, the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in Occupied Palestinian Territory. Uh, she is the writer of uh, several books, and most recent one focused on ISIS, which is in its... And the Palestine world. And uh, pa one on Palestine among the... Uh, what, uh, 11 books that she has uh, authored or edited. Uh, in addition to Phyllis, we're also proud to have today uh, my friend Shibli uh, Talhami, who is the Anwar Sadat Professor of Peace and Development at the University of uh, Maryland in College Park. He's also a non-resident senior fellow at Brookings Institution. Shibli is also uh, has a, a worldwide reputation in terms of his experience with Middle East politics in general, but particularly with the Palestine-Israeli issue, and he's also an authority on public opinion uh, polling uh, in the region, which he does uh, regularly, and I'm sure he will be uh, discussing either during the presentation or during the question and answer uh, some of the, let's say, the public opinion uh, with regards to, to these types of, of agreements. So with that said, uh, I will give each uh, of our speakers uh, 10 to 12 minutes I will uh, follow up with uh, kind of a bit of a, a commentary uh, after that with my own views uh, on, on what's happening with, uh, with this plan, and then we'll open the balance of time uh, for uh, questions and answers. We expect uh, that uh, the White House uh, is, uh, to re is supposed to release their plan or whatever, some version uh, of that plan about 1 o'clock. If they do while we're still here, we will be more than delighted uh, to make copies and distribute uh, to you before uh, you leave the premises. But with that said, again, welcome. And uh, Phyllis, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Khalil, and thank you all for coming. It's a little amusing, I suppose, that we planned this with this time just before the White House announced. And we can assume that they did it because we were all meeting here. Yes, that's, that's clearly the time. From what we know of what Trump said, he did say one thing that I think was true, although not at all in the way he meant it. He made a remark, an opening remark, that the Palestinians are trapped in a cycle of violence. And boy, is that ever true. I think he did not mean it the way we understand it. But the truth is, Palestinians are surrounded by violence. Violence of occupation, violence of the denial of the right of return, violence of inequality. All of that is violence, and it is what shapes Palestinian lives, whether those living under military occupation, those living as second or third class citizens inside Israel, and those millions who live as refugees and or exiles abroad. 
I think that what we can be certain of is that this plan, however it looks when it comes out, is really not about Israel-Palestine. It's not, it wasn't negotiated between Israelis and Palestinians. It was negotiated between the United States and Israel. Uh, it's really the meeting today is a meeting of the impeached and the indicted uh, to figure out how they should deal with this politically. They're using this in many ways, Trump in particular, Netanyahu in particular, but in general this is a highly politicized uh, process that I think will have very little immediate impact on the ground except to make certain diplomatic possibilities less likely, more difficult, more violations of international law. The goal of this plan has little or nothing to do with peace, certainly nothing to do with justice, which is of course the prerequisite for peace. It is, as I said, a legal and a political uh, possibility, and it's designed to provide legal and political protection, basically to keep Trump in the White House and keep Bibi Netanyahu out of jail. That's, that's the kind of main goal of it. And, of course, to get them both reelected in the upcoming elections. But all of this happens in a context, the broad context of which is unchallenged U.S. support for Israel. Uh, one of the long-standing members of the, uh, the, the peace process industry here in Washington uh, once said in his book that is that we, the U.S., acted as Israel's lawyers, which was, you know, one of those things you kind of wish he would have admitted while he was doing it, rather than five years later when he wrote a book. But nonetheless, it was important that he said it. That this was uh, Aaron David Miller, uh, one of many, who spent their lives, you know, in that process um, and used that still. I, I'm always amazed. This morning there he was on NPR saying, "I've worked in this in this effort for." More than 25 years, and I want to say, yeah, and how's that going for you? Oh, it, it's an astonishing thing, but nonetheless, it is a context in which U.S. support for Israel's position <coughs> remains consistent. The discourse in Washington sometimes changes a little bit. Public discourse has changed enormously. Shibley's polls bear that out every time. The public discourse shift has been enormously shifting. The shift in the media has been significant. It's not great. You look at the media now, it's still very one-sided. But compare it to what it was two years ago, five years ago, ten years ago. Seeing the word Nakba on the front page of the New York Times, that was unheard of just a few years back. So there's been a huge change there. On the political policy side of things, the change is almost not quite non-existent, but it's just barely getting started. It is starting because it does reflect to some degree the public and media shifts, but it is not anywhere close yet to where we need to go. What we know already exists that's going to be reflected in the terms of this new deal or this new offer is that in his three years in office, Trump has moved that pro-Israel assumption and operation to a much higher level. This is, as Netanyahu said this morning, the, the best president Israel ever had. Absolutely true. The recognition of Jerusalem as only the, the capital of Israel, the moving of the embassy to, his, to Jerusalem, recognition of the legality somehow imposed, new legality imposed by the U.S. of the Israeli occupation of the Syrian Golan Heights, the announcement that settlements are somehow not any longer in violation of international law, as if the U.S. State Department is empowered to transform international law into something entirely different. The decision to stop funding UNRWA completely and to cut all funding to Palestinian humanitarian agencies, including the funding of Palestinian hospitals. Closing the PLO office in, in, here in Washington, accepting uncritically the new Israeli nation state law that prohibits equality, a matter of law, not as a matter of decision making day to day, but as a matter of law, it now is the case in Israel that only Jews have the right of self-determination in the state of Israel. No one else, only Jews. So the 20% of the population who are citizens and are Palestinians have no ex expectation, no right 
of equality. And of course, here at home, the new anti-BDS legislation, the, the new executive order that creates a false definition of anti-Semitism by equating anti-Semitism not with the very real anti-Semitism that is on the rise, edged on by white supremacy and, and cheered by the White House, but claiming falsely that anti-Semitism is somehow tied to criticism of Israel. So this is going to have no Palestinian rights, uh, no right of return, no right to an end of occupation, no equality, nothing. What we probably will see is some talk, if not the word annexation, some acceptance of the notion that at least the Jordan Valley, which is about 30 percent of the West Bank, will remain under Israeli sovereignty. Uh, there will be Israeli sovereignty over virtually all of the illegal settlements. Uh, which now include about 650,000 people who are violating international law every morning simply by getting out of bed because they are living on illegally expropriated land. It will include, of course, full Israeli control of all of Jerusalem, with maybe offering to the Palestinians, well, you can have a little town. We'll give you, I understand it's not Abu Dis anymore. Now they're talking about uh, uh, Shuafat. So, okay, it's sort of the equivalent of somebody looking at New York and saying, well, we'll give you Newark, and you can call it New York. Well, you can call it what you want, but Newark is not New York. You can call Shufat what you want, you can call Abu Dis what you want, but they are not El Quds. And calling them that does not make it so. We will hear, I think, crucially about complete, permanent Israeli security control over all of the occupied territory. West Bank, Gaza, and occupied East Jerusalem. And Gaza. We won't hear a lot about Gaza, but what we will hear will indicate that what the United Nations said three years ago, four years ago, that Gaza would be uninhabitable by 2020, that there is no plan B for Gaza. We will not hear that because Gaza is now uninhabitable, 2020 is today. Gaza is uninhabitable, and yet it is inhabited by almost two million people, the vast majority of whom are under 30, and a huge component are children under 18, who are living with 97 percent of their very insufficient water undrinkable, with electricity that varies from three or four to maybe eight hours a day on a good day, without any ability to move out of their territory, without any ability to have family come in, with no control of their own borders. You know the story of Gaza. I think what we will see is that it will remain cut off. It will remain without a link either to the West Bank or to Palestinian Jerusalem. We will hear about an offer again. We will probably hear about $50 billion, which Trump assures us he can get. It's not clear from where. It's like saying, oh, yeah, Mexico is going to pay for the wall, right? And the Arab states are going to pay for Gaza. Yeah, that's going to happen. And there's one other aspect that I think we may see in this thing. I think we may be hearing about an end to the conflict. And that's a very important term. Because what it references is not an end to occupation, not an end to apartheid, not an end to inequality, but an end to the right to resist. So that once you have somebody in power, like the United States, declaring the conflict is over. From that point on, anyone who steps forward to say, you know what, the conflict is not so over because I still don't have my rights, what happens then is that person is outside, outside of acceptable discourse. They are now a terrorist. They are whatever name you want to choose. But they no longer have the right to say, no, this is not an end to the conflict because the conflict is grounded on the denial of rights. So Trump said yesterday that this is a situation where we can't have a deal without the Palestinians. But if they don't sign on, life goes on. And of course, for Israel, that's true. The notion that for Israel, the status quo is unacceptable, simply not true. The status quo is quite acceptable for Israel. They're doing fine. They're doing fine. For the U.S., the status quo is fine. For Palestinians, sometimes they can't live 
They're not getting medicine. They can't get out to get surgery in hospitals in the West Bank, for instance. The young people who were shot by Israeli snipers, 120 of whom have already had limbs, mostly legs, amputated as a result of those exploding bullets. The UN estimates that in the next two years, there's going to be over 270 more young people who were already shot who will eventually have to have their legs amputated because there is no longer the capacity for the kind of advanced surgical techniques to, to protect their legs. So we're going to have an epidemic of, of amputation in Gaza. We're not going to hear about a Palestinian state. We'll hear about something about enhanced autonomy, something like that. That's, I mean, it might not be that term, but it'll be something like that. And then we'll hear all the preconditions that will have to happen before we get there. So we'll have to have Gaza completely demilitarized, the disarming of Hamas, the end to what the Israelis like to call the financing of terror, which means supporting families whose, whose breadwinners are in Israeli prisons. And the Palestinians will have to recognize Israel as a Jewish state and recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital and give up all claims to it. Not very likely to happen. We will hear internationally some bits and pieces of opposition. There will be concern from the United Nations. There will be unease from the Europeans. There will be outrage from a few countries in the non-aligned movement. But little or none of that will involve any move to actually create anything that remotely resembles accountability for this set of new violations of international law. The UN will not recommend that Israeli officials or US officials responsible for these violations be brought up on charges in the International Criminal Court. We will not hear anyone else initiating a case in the International Col uh, Court of Justice. We will hear a little bit of talk, and then we will hear silence. I think we will hear the Europeans offering some support for Palestinian humanitarian institutions, maybe some hospitals that have been destroyed three, four, five times, and say, this is what we can do. We will give you some money. And when Israel bombs them again, we might give you money again to rebuild again. But we will do nothing to stop the Israeli assaults. So I think what will happen today is not likely to change anything on the ground. The question of annexation, which is a very big deal in this set of, of um, uh, negotiations, will it call for annexation? Probably not. It'll probably say something like sovereignty instead. Maybe it'll say annexation on just the, uh, just the, the uh, Jordan Valley. But the reality is the Jordan Valley and much of the West Bank, all of the territory surrounding the settlement blocks, all of those territories are already functionally annexed. So whether it's official or not doesn't matter very much. Israel remains in control. The Israeli military is the government or the governing agency over all of that territory. So the term that is used is more a question of what is this, the new starting point going to be for US policy? How is our job here going to change? That's going to be a big challenge. We're all going to have a lot more work to do. It's going to be a lot more difficult because we will not have the ability to count on international law, which the US has consistently violated, but which exists as a potential tool in our hands. We, the civil society, are the ones who can make the US abide by international law when they choose not to. With that taken away, our work is going to be much more difficult. So I will stop with that. Thank you, Phyllis. Go ahead. Shibley, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, thank you for hosting this. Uh, appreciate that. Um, so obviously, this is not uh, a deal. Uh, I know that uh, the term we've been using for some time now, deal of the century, uh, it clearly is not a deal. And if it's a deal, the policies are not part of it. Um, and it's not a peace plan, because there's no uh, uh, peace intended here even, not just that it's not likely to bring peace, but I don't think it's intended. Um, so while I agree that the timing of the release of the plan is political, meaning that it's intended to help the Prime Minister of Israel 
uh, upcoming election and Donald Trump uh, in facing impeachment. No question that timing was uh, related to those two. I don't think that's the driving uh, 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 force behind the actual plan itself. Um, I think if we've, this plan has been in the works from day one. Uh, it has, um, the architect of the plan, um, certainly we know who the team is, but uh, uh, probably Jared Kushner is not the, the central player, he's a central player, but perhaps the most central player is um, uh, David Friedman, uh, the president's envoy uh, to uh, Israel and his former bankruptcy lawyer. Uh, and uh, if you look at the agenda here, I think the agenda is principally to legitimize Israeli settlements uh, and to legitimize Israeli control of Jerusalem and annexation of parts of the West Bank. If this would come through some kind of agreement, they're happy to have it. If not, uh, this is you know, a unilateral set of conditions that empowers the Israeli right. So it is a pro-Israeli right. It's even wrong to say it's a pro-Israel because a lot of Israelis don't really see it, but it's a pro-Israeli right, pro-settler uh, kind of a plan. Uh, and that's the way it was intended, and I think that's the way it's presented, although the timing is obviously uh, political. Now, what I want to um, talk about is two things. One is the driving principles behind the plan as it is articulated, particularly by Jared Kushner uh, throughout the past uh, 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 two, three years, uh, but also more recently as, as stated in an article by the Washington Post today, uh, and also um, uh, talk about the kind of, what is the likely reaction to be ultimately in the region? What what. What would this do? Uh, does it really change anything along the lines that well, it started, but I, I want to broaden it a little bit more. Uh, so let me start with the, with the, um, the theoretical principles uh, that are put out on the table, the so-called brilliant new idea that we're st we, we starting with the reality as it is, and that the Palestinians have to accept that they're essentially the weaker party, uh, accept less, go for only part of the loaf, and if they don't now, they're going to be weaker down the road. They're going to have to accept less. This is, this is kind of the starting with the reality as it is. <clears throat> and now think about this for a minute. And now presumably this is used as an instrument to, to, put, to kind of uh, paint this as a, a, a version of realism. But consider uh, the idea of saying that um, uh, you know, essentially if you violate international law, uh, you're going to be rewarded by accepting the reality as it is. Part of the reality, obviously, that is being acknowledged here is the fact that there are a lot of settlements in the West Bank that are now going to uh, presumably come under Israeli sovereignty, even though these settlements, of course, were built uh, against international law with the opposition of every single president of the United States up until Donald Trump. And we're saying, yeah, well, you know, that's now reality, so let's accept it. So it's not only rewarding violation of international law. It's encouraging violation of international law. Imagine if you tell that to Ukraine, get over it. You know, the Russians are more powerful. Just accept reality as it is how even our political, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, body politic would react, whether it's Democrats or Republicans on, on this particular issue. But that's essentially what we're saying. But the second thing is that, you know, if you look at the American role, and there is uh, an argument to be made that, uh, as I have uh, with my colleagues in our book, The Peace Puzzle, uh, that in some ways, of course, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has not been a top uh, uh, security priority for the United States really with the end of the Cold War, since the end of the Cold War. And domestic politics has always been a, a central component of uh, American attitudes toward the Arab-Israeli conflict. But if you look at this reality as we're portraying it now, it is not just the settlement, it is just the asymmetry of power that is extraordinarily favoring the Israelis over the Palestinians. Uh, and the fact that the Arabs themselves are not at war with Israel, that are not really players in terms of bringing leverage uh, on behalf of the Palestinians in this game. And the fact that the international community has not been able to implement uh, its resolutions that would have weighed on behalf of the Palestinians over time. And if you look all the, at all these three sides, you see that the one central reason for this asymmetry 
is exactly American support for Israel over this period. Uh, obviously, the Camp David Accords, uh, the U.S. has not only medi mediated uh, the Camp David Accords between Egypt and Israel, uh, but has invested tens of billions of dollars since 1979 in maintaining that treaty, and that clearly took Egypt out of the war equation uh, with Israel, and that one reason why the Arabs have not uh, had the kind of weight they once had vis-a-vis -vis Israel. The second is that if you look at the Israeli advantage, the supremacy militarily, uh, partly you have to give the Israelis credit for building a very effective uh, military and, and organization they have over a relatively uh, short period of time. But if you look at the real reason for having the uh, techn technological and military advantage over any combined armies in the region, it is principally a function of the United States making sure that Israel alone has the top-notch technology to assure its supremacy in the region. That is part of what the U.S. does. And third, one reason why we have seen consequences for U.N. resolutions pertaining to violations such as settlement building is, in fact, the U.S. employment of the veto at the U.N., which has been employed on this issue more than any other issue in, since the U.N. Uh, uh, has, been, has been created. Uh, and so if you look at all these things, that we are complicit in the inequality that now exists. And now we say, OK, so now we've done all this. Instead of saying, well, now we now have responsibility to at least assure some fairness in relation to the Palestinians, we're actually saying, uh, now that we have helped create this inequality, let's start with this inequality. Uh, lest it get worse for the Palestinians down the road. There's something absurd about it, uh, something that really kind of uh, un-American, if you wish, uh, something that uh, uh, I think does, doesn't uh, jive with, uh, with how, uh, how this is uh, being uh, portrayed. And the final point I want to make is that um, if you look aside, uh, if you look away from the statement which is ignoring international law, ignoring UN resolutions, starting with the, uh, with the inequality as it is, and saying, uh, as Kushner was quoted to say, history doesn't matter. You shouldn't remember history at all. History shouldn't be part of it. Let's start with today, not rather with, with yesterday, except for, except for a religious narrative of history, uh, which is actually put forth uh, invoked in the justification for control over Jerusalem and the West Bank as, as invoked by uh, Trump's envoy to Israel or, uh, uh, or the, the Vice President of the United States Pence in their speeches invoking biblical <clears throat> narrative as a reason for, uh, uh, for Israeli political sovereignty. Now, I have a lot of respect for religions, whether it's Judaism, Islam, Christianity, but to use religion as a basis for political sovereignty in the 21st century is absurd and wrong. And, and not only that, it plants the seeds of religious confrontation down the road today. May not be the day where we're going to see that conflict, but if you go down that road and you, you, you frame the conflict in those terms, uh, beware of what you're going to have 10 years from now, 20 years from now. This is not going to go away because that's a zero-sum game. It's going to come back to haunt you, whether you're an Israeli or Palestinian. No, there are no winners in this game. Now, what about the reaction in the short term? Now, uh, of course, the Palestinians are not going to accept it, and they haven't, and they will, will not, and, and I don't see any environment changing. And I'm not saying Palestinians have, been, have handled all this perfectly. I mean, that's, let's put that aside for now in terms of the Palestinians. Uh, all mess, their own mess at home in, in terms of, of, of running their own, uh, the Palestinian leadership I'm talking about. Um, but nonetheless, I, I can't see anyone, uh, no matter who it is, uh, possibly accepting what has been put on the table, both in, in terms of the, the preemptive actions that were taken already by the Trump administration and what is actually being put on the table that is being accepted. But what about the rest of the Arab world? And what about the international community? And what about the body politic in America? I want to say a couple of things here. Um, I have no doubt that Arab governments are distracted from this issue, that they're, um, uh, they have interest with the Trump administration, 
uh, that are uh, m more immediate to them, such as uh, in the Gulf, uh, Iran, or domestic issues, or um, uh, Yemen, or additional challenges that they have to face. Uh, and they cannot afford to go frontally against the Trump administration, even if they wanted to. Uh, and therefore, uh, most of them uh, will, will find a way to be accommodationists, not necessarily embracing. Uh, but it'll vary from, from place to place. But I don't think, certainly, uh, you're going to have the kind of uh, uh, massive opposition that's going to be meaningful. Uh, and I think with regard to uh, public opinion uh, in the Arab world, um, I have, of course, over the years done a lot of public opinion uh, polls in, in the that show uh, that this uh, issue is very important to public opinion. But nonetheless, this is not a priority for public opinion. So while I say it's important to them, uh, it's not a priority. So if you are a, uh, an Algerian, you're not thinking about Palestine, even though you care about Palestine. You're caring about your immediate challenges. If you're in Iraq, look at what they're going through. Uh, you care about the Palestinians. You some, even you invoke Palestine. It has been invoked even in Algeria in the demonstrations, and it has been invoked in Iraq. It is still invoked, but it's not the top priority issue. But to say it's not the top priority issue is to misunderstand uh, that, is, that it is still an extremely important identity issue for Arabs. And it might not be important today, but it's going to be, there will be a day, more of the next day, that is going to come back to the top two, among the top priorities for a variety of things that might be happening regionally. And here in the US, um, uh, 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 as, as Phyllis alluded to, um, I think um, uh, there is a change in environment. We see it already. I mean, frankly, uh, the Democrats have attacked this plan before it was released uh, across the board, including by strongly pro-Israel Democrats who said we can't accept it. Uh, and for a variety of reasons, some of them, you know, having to do with uh, politics, some of them having to do with the notion that people still holding on to a two-state solution idea. There are many reasons why they're doing it. But the fact is, even the mainstream body politic Democrats is going uh, against this plan. Uh, public opinion, uh, as I have shown uh, in, in my um, uh, polls, has been divided, of course, along uh, uh, party lines, where Republicans have been very uh, pro-Israel, although I have to show you in my poll that I even wrote an article saying, is Trump more pro-Netanyahu than his base? Uh, uh, in fact, while the Republicans are solidly behind a pro-Israeli policy, they want Trump to take pro-Israeli policy, they think he's too pro-Israel, actually, in the polls, even Republicans. And I've shown that in some of the polls. But the big change is among Democrats. Uh, that we have seen. And, and there we have seen uh, strong opposition uh, to, the Israeli pol to the policy of the Israeli government, uh, the, to the Trump policy on this issue, uh, even openness to imposition of sanctions on Israel, uh, things that used to be completely out of the mainstream and are now part of the democratic uh, political process. Uh, will this have an impact in the short term? Of course not, because I think while it's going to have an impact in uh, the primaries, um, where uh, it'll, it'll, it'll probably mobilize some of the constituents of the Democratic Party. And in the end, of course, the main election here in America is really about much broader issue. Uh, you're either for Trump or against Trump, and that's going to determine uh, the outcome of our election and our own issues of uh, Israel-Palestine uh, will not be critical in this uh, election year. Uh, but obviously, uh, going to come back after the election. Thank you, Shibli. Uh, before I proceed with my uh, final remarks in terms of the panel here, uh, just I would like to remind you that there are uh, uh, question cards on your seats or on the table in front of you. For those of you who have any particular uh, question to raise, address it to specific uh, speaker up here and. Um, indicate your name and your affiliation. When you're ready for your question to be picked up, just uh, raise your hand and um, uh, staff will pick up the questions and, and bring it up here for me uh, to read. Please write legibly so I could read that. Um, 
There is a summary of the plan, uh, copies of which will be uh, made for you on the way out. The media is beginning to pick up. Uh, this one is from The Guardian that just came out. So we will make copies for you as you leave that include some of the highlights of the plan. Looking at it uh, just quickly, it looks like similar to some of the leaks uh, that I have seen and many of you probably have seen in the Israeli uh, Hebrew media over the past uh, couple of days. Uh, it looks like the same points almost. So at any rate, if anything else comes up, we will make copies for you on the way out. Uh, let me conclude by saying the following. Um, uh, based on what I have heard from my uh, colleagues up here, it seems to me that uh, uh, the Trump so-called uh, deal of the century that is being released as we speak today uh, is neither a peace plan in terms of the conventional diplomatic sense of the word, nor is it a peace plan in the American tradition of peace processing that we have, some of us I know in this room have been watching that and even participating in uh, the, the, that uh, sport uh, for uh, over the years. Uh, it is, as far as I'm concerned, it is a veiled attempt by President Trump uh, to rescue his friend uh, Netanyahu from political extinction. He is having some difficult time. Uh, as you know, this morning he did withdraw because of the lack of support uh, his petition before the Knesset uh, to give him immunity uh, because some of the right-wing parties uh, pulled out uh, basically their support for him uh, and the uh, attorney general in Israel went ahead and proceeded uh, with the indictment. So right now he is formally uh, an uh, indicted uh, person and will be facing trial on the three main uh, charges uh, that uh, he has been facing uh, for a while. So I, as far as I'm concerned, the purpose of this exercise today at the White House uh, is to uh, an attempt by both uh, politicians to uh, enhance the chances of each other uh, for uh, re-elections in terms of uh, March 2nd for Netanyahu and September 3rd uh, or November 3rd for uh, Trump uh, later in, in the year. And, you know, it's quite ironic that the two leaders are meeting today uh, amidst uh, political turmoil, and that's not accidental. Uh, turmoil in Israel and turmoil here uh, in Washington uh, and, attempt and uh, pretending uh, to be uh, advocating a solution for the 71-year-old uh, Israeli Arab-Israeli uh, conflict, even though the, the president made another slight uh, error, slight uh, error yesterday, referring to it as century-old conflict. I don't think this we're dealing here Arab-Israeli conflict as a century-old conflict or centuries-old uh, uh, conflict. But at any rate, uh, Century. yeah. Uh, the, um, uh, the, you know, attempts at peacemaking in the Middle East are not new. They haven't been invented by the Trump administration. Uh, correct me, uh, guys, if I'm mistaken, but I think the last time I counted, I bet it's the 77th attempt at peacemaking in the Middle East since 1937 with the first partition proposal. Uh, and about half of these proposals, by the way, were American proposals or have had, had something to do uh, with uh, uh, the U.S. policy uh, at the time. So there is this huge cemetery uh, of Middle East uh, peace proposals uh, in the region. And it, it, uh, if I were in the administration, uh, I think it, it behooved them uh, to take a look before embarking on this uh, so supposedly new endeavor uh, to look at the reasons as to why uh, so many peace processes have failed and to try to avoid uh, these mistakes that caused failure in the past, if indeed uh, Arab-Israeli uh, peace or Palestinian-Israeli specifically peace uh, is uh, the objective here. So when I look at the scene of, of the, the two politicians uh, standing shoulder to shoulder uh, this morning, uh, I'm reminded uh, of the metaphor, the blind leading the blind. I mean, it, it's, it's just kind of strange, uh, frankly. and. Uh, uh, most of you, of course, uh, do not speak Arabic, but some of you do, so I'll give you the Arabic version of that because I think it's a little bit more descriptive, uh, typically. All, all proverbs in Arabic tend to be a little bit more descriptive than uh, their English version. Uh, for those of you who speak Arabic, I'm sure you're going to laugh. Okay, uh, which literally means a blind makeup artist is applying makeup to her crazy client. Okay, the first one uh, doesn't know uh, neither one knows what they are doing, but they are forging ahead. 
the blind hair, hairdresser or, or, or the uh, makeup artist doesn't see her client, and the client doesn't see what's happening to her face either. So that, that's what's happen, uh, happening today, a beautification process uh, where neither party knows exactly what they're doing or what they're applying to each other. Uh, what is essentially, what do we expect? I think once the, the, the uh, document is released, you're going to find at least four or five points that are going to be in common with whatever version is, uh, short version, uh, excerpts, or what have you, will be released today. I think the first point is going to be that Israel is going to be given a green light to annex or to extend its sovereignty, whatever the terminology, to 30% of the area of the West Bank. That is going to happen today. Okay? The Palestinians are going to be recognized as having authority over some parts of areas A and B, which also amounts for an equal 30 to 40 percent of the West Bank. The plan, whether it's announced in full or not today, will leave about 30 percent of the West Bank in limbo. That's to be determined after the transition period. This plan announced today will have a transition period of four years which is bad news for the Palestinians. They have been through a transition period in the 90s, if you remember, for three years, and nothing happened. After which they were promised, like this time, that they will be able to declare statehood after the three years. And they are, not only we are repeating the same mistake, but we are extending three years into four years now. So that's uh, number one. Number two, at the end of this transition period, the, the main gesture made toward the Palestinians, according to the Arab parties that have read the Arab, Arab government and supposedly, according to Trump, have approved it uh, for him, the Palestinians will be able to declare an independent state in that section of, of the West Bank that he's talking about. However, as uh, we heard earlier, that section will be totally demilitarized. It will have, the Palestinians will have no control whatsoever over their aerial space or border crossings. So it will be another sieged Gaza in the West Bank for all practical purposes. And to add insult to injury, that that Palestinian entity or state will not be allowed to form any alliances with any external power. So what, what do the Palestinians, for example, do with the 130 plus countries that recognize them diplomatically today? Do they have to go back and retreat from those relationships? What do they do with all these uh, international agreements that they have joined over the past 10, 15 years? Do they go back to the UN and say, sorry, Israel doesn't allow us or Trump doesn't want us to, so we're going to pull out of all these agreements? Third, you get the issue of Jerusalem. The agreement as it was leaked uh, to the Israeli media states very clearly, Jerusalem will remain entirely under Israeli sovereignty. Okay. Forget about the statement by the Saudi media the, the last couple of hours saying that that's not the case, that they did not approve this. Their version did not say that. That version is very clear. The, Israeli, the, the, the leaked Israeli version is, is very clear. And it says, again, contrary to the Saudi claim, that the Temple Mount, quote unquote, Al Haram Sharif, and other holy places will be under the joint supervision of both Israel and the Palestinians, unlike the Saudi version that says it will remain under Jordanian supervision. It won't. So uh, these are some of the issues that, that we need to uh, worry about, including, by the way, uh, another gesture made to the Palestinians. Yeah, you, you can have a uh, foot uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the Jerusalem area. Actually, everything. Notice the new borders being drawn in the Middle East. This is a new Sykes-Picot here. Anything beyond the wall, security wall that Israel calls in Jerusalem, is considered Palestinians. You can have your capital in Shafat, which had the refugee camp that happens to be outside uh, the wall. But now the new border, as far as this promise by Trump, is the wall, which is, it has no international significance, legal significance. But all of a sudden, by diktat, God decreed that the wall now is the new border. So the green line is out. Ceasefire lines from 47, 48 are out. Um, 
The Palestinians, uh, as I said, will be able to have a capital according to this, but it will be uh, in, in uh, Shafat. Uh, then you got the issue with Gaza. Uh, it's true that Gaza doesn't play a central ro role in this, except hinted as a kind of indirect beneficiary to the $50 billion supposedly that are going to be contributed and spent on not just Palestine. The Israeli media, by the way, made a mistake, said 50 billion earmarked for projects in Palestine. No, the 50 billion are earmarked for projects pertaining to Palestine. Part of them, about 20, estimated 20 billion earmarked for Palestine. The rest are for the neighboring Arab countries, uh, Jordan, Egypt, Lebanon, and, and, and so on. Uh, on condition, of course, that uh, the uh, PLO or the PA will exert its authority over Gaza as if they could do that. I mean, they've been trying to do that with the help of the US and on their own, and it hasn't happened in the last 10 years. And more importantly, specifically, it states they have to disarm the militants in Gaza. Good luck. Uh, the only uh, additional item, uh, of course, it, it sounds humanitarian from an American perspective, but frankly, quite insulting from a Palestinian perspective, uh, Mr. Trump insists on having, for humanitarian reasons, a tunnel dug between Gaza and the West Bank so people can be the free flow of people. Uh, I'd like to see a tunnel between here and Canada or a tunnel between here and, and Mexico to facilitate human uh, misery in, in this part uh, of the world. So with that said, I'll, I'll stop here, but uh, I think you got a whiff of why uh, this agreement, uh, as it's being leaked uh, and may be announced uh, somehow today, uh, is a non-starter, uh, at least for one half of the people involved in this conflict. Thank you for your attention. Let's go to your uh, questions and answers. Okay. Uh, Omar Rahman, Brookings. We have heard that the Americans, Israelis are trying to, what the, Isra the Americans and the Israelis are trying to achieve, but what should the Palestinians be doing in this moment? You want to start with that, Shimli? Uh, yeah, I, I um, you know, I, I don't know. Um, it's not like I, I have a, a great uh, uh, advice to what the Palestinians should, should be. Um, I do know that, uh, at where Palestinians are. I think the biggest failure, in my own opinion, uh, has been that they have not uh, built strong Arab support over the past two years for the position. And I mean, yes, I understand that there is a changed political environment in the Arab world, and Arab governments have their own priorities, and the Palestinians could be uh, over you know, uh, taken by an, uh, an active American uh, policy vis-a-vis -vis Saudi Arabia or the UAE or Qatar or you know, any other Gulf state. Uh, but I think in the end, the importance of the Palestinian question internationally has been predicated on two things. Uh, one is the Arab reservoir of support, the argument that it's important for Arabs. And two, it's a prototype of a human rights uh, and uh, an international law uh, uh, kind of uh, view globally, in, including in America. Those are the two anchors of support, other than what the Palestinians do in their relationship with Israel directly, obviously, that matters. And, and I think that um, uh, I, I, I have always believed, uh, and certainly have seen this, uh, observing it, given how important the Arab context for the Palestinians is and why, in fact, the Europeans or the U.S. historically thought that they need to deal with the Palestinian issue, not because Palestine is particularly important or the Palestinian people are particularly important, very small population. It is because it was assumed that it was important for the rest of, of the Arab world or beyond that even to Muslim-majority countries. Uh, and to that extent, I think, um, the Palestinians have allowed that support to erode without an active way to bolster uh, the, the support and build a strategy, whether it's a vis-a-vis -vis directly uh, the Arab public in a changing international environment or 
uh, to create uh, key meaningful alliances with Arab states or Muslim majority countries. Uh, whether or not they can do that at this point, I rather doubt it because I think um, there is a strategy. Uh, you can, you know, there's obviously uh, there's a little bit of that still taking place. Uh, uh, you know, Mahmoud Abbas just called for an emergency meeting of the Arab League. Uh, that's not going to do much. That's not what I mean by that kind of support a statement from an Arab League that has no power. I mean there has to be some consolidation of interest and and coordination and joint policy, but beyond that even at the public level. Uh, the second part is obviously what I said, you know, about this being a human rights and international law constituency globally. It certainly resonates in Europe for that reason in part. It resonates uh, in America based on the research that I've done uh, in principle because it is a prototype of that kind of thing. And I don't see an active Palestinian strategy to consolidate those relations. And over the long haul, this is going to be the main thing. There's also a way of addressing the Israelis. The other constituency for the Palestinians is Israelis directly. Um, how they, in an environment like this, where the Israeli right is being empowered, Israel is uh, coming uh, toward an election in March. Um, uh, Palestinian Israelis are empowered like never before. They elected 13 mandates in the Knesset the last time around. Uh, if they vote in large numbers this time, uh, they can outdo themselves and they could get maybe 15 uh, members uh, that could actually alter the balance a, a lot more. So I think um, they have to find a language to address the Israelis a little more actively. Uh, I don't, I think that despite the tilt to the right in Israel, and over time it has happened, I think there, there, there are people who are asking questions, who are worried as Israelis for their own interests. They see, they see the writing on the wall, people who see that this kind of definition of the conflict as a religious conflict down the road or that Trump's support is, is, is not really genuine support or lasting. So I think that's, those are the areas of engagement. It requires something uh, a little bit unconventional, and I don't see it happening. Yeah, I'd like to, do you want to add something to yeah, Go ahead. Just I'm certainly not going to say what I think the Palestinians should do. I'm a Jewish girl from California. It's really not my call. But I do think that it's important to recognize that what is happening, both in Palestine and globally, uh, among Palestinians is a movement that isn't grounded in the peace process diplomacy of, that started 30 years ago. And I think your point, Shibley, about the focus on human rights is absolutely right. The reason that the bulk of the movements in the U.S. that are now working so hard on Palestinian rights define it in terms of rights and not states, that none of the organizations are focused on, well, a couple are, I, I won't say that, but the ones that are the most active and that are the ones that are growing are not focused on states. We want a two-state solution. We want one state. It's about rights. And when you're talking about rights, it internationalizes it. It's part of the reason that the, the analogy with South African apartheid was so powerful. It's not because Israeli oppression of Palestinians looks like South Africa. It doesn't. They're very, very different. But what they share is this question of separation and violation of international law. And that's what made it sort of shocking and stunning for people to think about it in that way. And I think when we look at sort of what are the Palestinians doing, we should be looking not just at what are Palestinian diplomats doing, what is the PA doing, what is Hamas doing, frankly none of whom, in, as far as I can tell, have all that much support at home. Those who do have support is Palestinian civil society, who among other things were the ones who created the BDS movement. That didn't come out of the PLO or the PA or Hamas, it came out of civil society, 170 Palestinian organizations, from trade unions to women's groups to my personal favorite, the Dentists Association. Um, so, you know, I think that that understanding has, has shaped a lot of the work that's going on, especially here. And on your last point, I would just add that I think we're not just seeing a, a sort of shift to the right in Israel. It has been a massive consolidation of a far right uh, scenario in which right now in his existing cabinet, despite it being you know, un, unstable and all that, Netanyahu is one of the furthest left of that, of that cabinet. Not because he's moved, but because 
the, the political realities of who's in power in Israel have shifted so far to the right that this right-wing guy over here, standing still, is now further to the left. So that means that our work is here and stopping the U.S. support, whether it's the $3.8 billion a year of military aid, whether it's the veto at the U.N., whether, all of these things. So it comes back to us. There is another question for you, uh, Phyllis, uh, from Dan Lieberman. Basically saying, I understand it's uh, kind of difficult uh, for the Palestinians within Palestine and outside having little power to kind of coordinate an effective uh, strategy. With what you just mentioned, can this, though, internationally be turned into an actual strategy to prevent Israel from continuing to expand and getting the rest of, of Palestine swallowed? No, not by itself. BDS is not a strategy for Palestinian liberation. It's a strategy for, it's a, it's a campaign. It's a movement, it's a campaign that aims to bring nonviolent economic pressure on Israel to stop three very specific violations of international law. If those three violations were ended, the boycott, the divestment campaigns would end. But that wouldn't mean that Palestine was liberated. It, there is a need for a, a real national strategy for a Palestinian national movement. You know, back 40 years ago, that there was one demand globally that reflected the demand of the PLO, which was recognition of the PLO as the sole legitimate representative of the Palestinian people. And that was sort of the demand of all the movements that were around in protests and in demonstrations and whatever. Once that happened, which was in, the, was in 1988, there, there was more uncertainty about what is the strategy, where does the diplomacy fit in. There was a lot of concern in, among Palestinian diplomats we're going to stick to this peace process because only the U.S. can deliver Israel. That was true. The problem was the U.S. never had any intention of delivering Israel. So holding on to it didn't get the result that they were hoping for. I think that the, the campaigns that exist, the BDS campaign, especially these days the campaign in the U.S. to challenge the U.S. military aid to Israel, which at $3.8 billion is a whole lot of money. It's a whole lot of money. It's more than half of the, wait, if I have the figures right, I think it's more than half of the entire military aid budget. I'm not positive of that. I have to check the figures. But it's a huge component of U.S. aid. And the question emerges, Israel is, well, depending on whether you believe the CIA or the IMF is either the 23rd or the 27th wealthiest country in the world, why are we giving them aid at all, let alone military aid, when it's already the, the most powerful military power in the region and the only nuclear power in the region. So there's all of these challenges that, again, come back to the United States. So I think the BDS movement is important. I don't think it's the only one out there. I think that all of these nonviolent movements that are aimed at bringing pressure to bear for Palestinian rights is what holds out the possibility of success. Uh, I would like to weigh in a little bit on the earlier question that Omar uh, asked with regards to what the Palestinians should be doing uh, at this uh, time. Uh, we've had that debate uh, recently among Palestinians here and, and in, uh, in the States and in, uh, in Palestine. And frankly, uh, this plan is not new, right? So the plan has, is being, has been leaked uh, pieces and bits over quite a few months. And the Palestinian leadership has failed to really uh, come up with a strategy uh, or even a clear policy on how, on how uh, to deal uh, with this. So they kept betting on a change in Washington, change in, in Jerusalem, change here, change there. Uh, and uh, they remained somewhat passive throughout that period. I think personally that one thing uh, we have suggested, several of us, uh, in the past, and, and we would re-suggest that again today, is just think with me for a moment. That sheet of paper, that fact sheet that was distributed to you when you came in, that summarizes the, the content of the plan. What if, which we, we have had a similar list before and discussed it with the Palestinian leadership, what if the Palestinian leadership over the past six months has studied that sheet and looked at it item by item, and responded to it, and, t and today at noon in Ramallah and in New York, 
issued a Palestinian manifesto in response saying, we, the Palestinian people, do want a peaceful resolution. After all, we have paid the highest price thus far as a result of this conflict. And this is how we envision peace as happening. One, two, three, four, the same points, same issues, put their version on it, and make a campaign worldwide uh, uh, to, to answer that. It, it, it's not necessarily going to prevent the White House from doing what it did today, but at least it would create some clarity both in Palestine, in Israel, and worldwide that will show where the Palestinians stand. Right now, the average person concerned about the Palestinians, who is not necessarily well-versed in Arab-Israeli matters, is confused about what the Palestinian response uh, to these things are. And, and that's one thing that, that could, have, uh, could have been done. Uh, there is another question from Contessa. I don't know if I understand the question correctly, but the Palestinians could uh, get involved in uh, negotiations and maybe ask for land in the Negev in return. Uh, who's Contessa? Correct me if, if um, I didn't read it. Could this be part of the negotiation process? If they can acquire Negev land, as, as Israelis could get entitlement in return. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll leave that or direct that to, to Shibli, but uh, go ahead. Uh, I'm not sure I fully understood the question Neither. that whether, whether, uh, the Palestinians should get parts of the Sinai in exchange for? Uh, in the Negev in exchange for what? Settlements. For the settlements? Um, now, um, okay, so uh, the truth of the matter is that in, in the negotiations, and I have been involved in the, in the negotiation of the American side over the years as well, um, in the negotiations uh, between Israel and the Palestinians, including the ones during uh, the Obama administration. Um, the, the idea of some, some swaps, uh, uh, possibly one-to-one -one swaps, was put forth. Um, and that was in conjunction with the thought that um, what was being talked about is really the settlement blocks that are adjacent to the Green Line, uh, that it was assumed in a, uh, in a settlement that would be a based on two-state solution with full sovereignty for the Palestinians. Um, would be incorporated to Israel, and in exchange, Israel would grant. Uh, um, it wasn't said one to one. You know, obviously, it was not an agreement, but it was part of the the discussion. Um, uh, would be granted some uh, uh, land that was under Israel control before part of Israel, pre sixty seven, Israel, and so. Um, and, and that included possibly in, in the Negev. There are various places that people painted. Uh, the most troubling part wasn't that that idea was still on the table. I don't think the Palestinians, the Palestinians were open to it as long as it was roughly equal or roughly of the same value or something along these lines. Um, the, the more troubling part was something that has been in the discourse and has been actually in, in recent days have been discussed. Some of the Israeli media even suggested it might be incorporated or alluded to in the, in the Trump peace plan is to um, uh, carve out uh, some Palestinian communities within Israel itself, citizens of Israel, who don't want, who, who still want to remain within Israel, and sort of carve it out, particularly ones in the so-called triangle closer to Tel Aviv in the center, uh, to, uh, to a potential Palestinian state. But here we're not even talking about Palestinian state. I'm not sure what carving out, um, uh, you know, a, uh, um, a population over and turn it over. So I think at this point, um, the whole idea of this land swap was predicated on the assumption you're going to have two states, uh, roughly based on the 67 border, that will be both sovereign. So you talk, that's what you're talking about. In, in this case, I don't see that at all. I don't see the plan as, as talking about a, a truly sovereign Palestinian state. If I can just add one, two quick points. One is on the question of the states. I think part of the problem with earlier processes was that they never envisioned two actually equal states. There was never going to be equality between the two states. It was always included that there would not be Palestinian uh, sovereignty control, sovereign control of their own borders, of their airspace, of the underground, of their coastal waters. That was never, that was never on the agenda. 
So even when it was called a state, that we're talking about two states or two states with swaps, it was never equality between the states. The other thing is the nature of the land. The land in the Negev, you're talking about desert land. The, the settlements are on the most fertile, the most wealthy, the most potentially productive land in the area, the most built up land, and the water. The water is crucial because when we look at this notion, which I think is absolutely right, that from the Israeli vantage point and now the US, the separation wall is the new border of, of what Palestinian territory will be in some form. If you impose on that map a map of the six major aquifers of the Palestinian territory, they're all just inside. So the wall was designed to make sure that the, the precious water of Palestinian land becomes part of Israel. And that's very much what would be involved if there was going to be a swap between built up settlement land and desert land in the Negev. Uh, David Little asks uh, about the uh, Gantz role in this. And uh, did he say anything uh, about this plan before he left? Well, he, he, did, uh, he did say something favorable about it, although it sounded like he wanted to wait uh, until after the Israeli election for any action. Uh, to uh, take place. There's a report uh, in the Israeli press today as well uh, suggesting that uh, Trump had already asked the Prime Minister of Israel uh, anyway to wait uh, before he annexes the territory, so not to go ahead and annex it now, uh, something that uh, Netanyahu would have liked to do and still would like to do it as, as something that might help him before in the March, elections yes, before sir. March. Uh, so, uh, but Gantz has, <laughs> has uh, he was put in a bind. Obviously, he's not, you know, he, he has said some things that are expansionist, including uh, the, the thought that uh, Israel should annex the Jordan Valley. Uh, but on this, in this particular case, he was obviously put in a bind. Um, this was, he knew this is intended to help his rival. Uh, in, in the election, and, uh, and he knew if he were to come, he would only be a secondary player, and it would hurt him as well. He tried to make the best of it by carving out the meeting with the, with the president separate from the meeting today, which was had uh, yesterday. Um, uh, but he can't be particularly happy because this obviously is helping his rival. One way or the other, it's helping his rival. Yeah. Uh, let me just add to that, I agree with you. Uh, Gantz gave an elaborate speech, a uh, well-crafted speech, I listened to it in Hebrew, uh, before he left and uh, did quite a few uh, interviews uh, with the Israeli media. Uh, Gantz, uh, as Shibley just said, uh, was not too comfortable coming to Washington. He didn't like the idea. As a matter of fact, he had to be forced, pressured internally uh, within his camp. Uh, to come to Washington. His idea was this is a conspiracy between Trump and Netanyahu uh, to do him in because the purpose of this exercise is to re-elect uh, Netanyahu and I don't want to be just a prop for that. Uh, his people said, but let's look at the price we have to pay as a camp in terms of the March 2nd elections if you are not to go. Uh, we, you will leave basically the field wide open for Netanyahu to dominate the media and to put his own spin uh, on the Trump plan, so please go. And they wrote, they wrote a superb speech for him, in which basically, again, from an objective perspective, not necessarily I'm a fan of Gantz, I'm not. Uh, I mean, the, to me, the elections in March is between a right-winger and a, another candidate more to the right, a far right-winger. Uh, but. Um, the, uh, he did express support for the plan. He said did, he didn't use quite the flowery words that Netanyahu used to depict the plan, uh, but he did say that it was a positive plan and that as Prime Minister of Israel, he would be delighted uh, to attempt to uh, implement it after uh, the, uh, the uh, elections. Addressed to you, Phyllis, uh, from Richard uh, Coleman. Uh, if there were a total ceasing of quote unquote rock throwing or other P Palestinian uh, actions or attitudes toward Israel, would that change the political situation at all? It's those damn stones again. All right. Those children with stones. <laughs> uh, no, 
I mean, we saw that in the first intifada, which was a nonviolent intifada. There were kids who threw stones at bulldozers. Uh, and did that change? It set the terms that, in a certain way, you could argue led to Oslo, and we know Oslo failed. It's because the power relations didn't change. Uh, and the U.S. continued to provide money, military support, acceptance of a nuclear monopoly, using its veto at the United Nations to allow Israeli domination and control to continue unabated. Uh, three wars against Gaza, the, the complete denial of rights of the Palestinians. Um, I don't think the problem facing Israel uh, is the problem of stones. Uh, the last question I have is from uh, Huda. Uh, it says my, uh, to, to all of you, uh, my impression is that such a deal is acceptable to the Israeli establishment. Uh, could you comment on, let's say, the role? Who, who's going to welcome that deal uh, in Israel? Uh, is there a specific role for the right wing radical parties or elements uh, in Israel to aggressively push this type of plan forward? And First, again, I, I think we shouldn't refer to it as a deal because there's no deal here as a plan. Um, and, um, um, you know, it, it, obviously it, it uh, fits into uh, the, the right-wing agenda. It plays into it. Uh, and Israel has moved to the right. So, in fact, uh, the, the only reason why there was a chance to prevent the right from forming a government was the fact that uh, Arab parties uh, uh, were... Uh, part of the equation. Uh, if you take Arab parties out, uh, overwhelmingly Israeli parties are to the right. Uh, so people think that Israel is actually divided now or somewhat closely divided. Uh, it is divided only because you have 20% uh, of our citizens who have 13 members of the Knesset that make it a little bit closer and still the right wing is more. So. Um, so I think that it, it obviously plays into the hands of, of the right-wing Israel. It makes it harder uh, even for people in the center. The left is, uh, you know, um, really a protest movement at this point. Uh, uh, and so I, I think that um, um, the, the real issue, if, if the Israelis had a way of resolving their conflict with the Palestinians on their own, they would have done it a long time ago. Um, so what is preventing a solution has not been really a green light from America because, frankly, the Israelis have been able to do what they wanted to do, no matter what the American position is. There, it, has, it has been maybe a little bit of constraint, but not a major constraint on Israeli behavior, uh, perhaps formalizing whether it's annexed or not. I'm not even sure the formalization makes a difference. So they applied Israeli law to the Golan Heights, it really hasn't changed uh, the relationship between Israel and the Golan Heights vis-a-vis -vis the international community. Um, so I, I don't, I think what is keeping, what is keeping the Palestinians in play is the Palestinians. And the fact that the Israelis simply do not have a unilateral solution. And this is not gonna be a unilateral solution. Uh, it might help, uh, legitimize extremists in Israel, and that's troubling. Um, uh, it might generate a, uh, a violent reaction from the Palestinians at some point. That's troubling. Um, uh, but I don't think it's going to address the core issues, and the Israelis ultimately are not going to be able to use this plan uh, to bring about uh, a, a, any kind of uh, uh, settlement of peace that's acceptable to them. With that, uh, okay. well, just quickly, I, I think that I would just disagree with one point, Shibley, which is that I don't think there's any incentive for the Israelis, either on their own or with U.S. support, to make peace, as you put it, with the Palestinians. The status quo is fine for them. It's problematic on occasion, but it's, it's basically fine. Affordable. Uh, it's affordable, right. The, the challenges are affordable. Uh, Israeli passports are valid all over the world. It's a wealthy country. It's the only nuclear power in the region. It's the most powerful conventional military in the region. It's, it's doing fine. 
Um, I think that what we're, what we're looking at here is the U.S. trying to orchestrate something that it can claim as a victory, aside from all of the individual stuff about, you know, keeping people out of jail and reelected. Uh, that's always been the U.S. position. Um, and I think that that part has not changed. We're not looking at a situation of, this isn't a border dispute between Peru and Ecuador, where they come to the table with somebody's outside support and say, okay, who, who's going to give up what? This is an occupied population on occupied territory with an occupying force. So that's not the basis for negotiations. It's not the basis for negotiating as equals. You can sit at the same table on the, with chairs of the same height. You're still not going to be equal.